Can climate change be beaten? In this special episode of Upfront, I'll ask author and activist Naomi Klein and the UN's climate chief, Christiana Figueres. I'm Mehdi Hassan, and in this special edition of the show, a new study by NASA has revealed that the month of February smashed global temperature records. Scientists now say we're in the midst of a climate emergency. So is the recent UN agreement in Paris on carbon emissions too little, too late? I'll ask the UN's outgoing climate change chief, Christiana Figueres. But first, She's one of the world's best-known critics of big corporations and uncontrolled capitalism. And in her latest best-selling book, This Changes Everything, she says you can't take on climate change without taking on capitalism too. Earlier, I sat down with this week's headliner, Naomi Klein. <music> Naomi Klein, thanks for joining me on Upfront. You write in your latest book, This Changes Everything, that a growing number of scientists now agree, quote, there is still time to avoid catastrophic warming, but not within the rules of capitalism as they're currently constructed. I want to come back to the capitalism point in a moment, but first, how much time do we have left, in your view, to avoid catastrophic warming? So the decade we're in um, is sometimes called decade zero when it comes to climate change, in that we really do need to get emissions pointing in the right direction. Our global emissions are still going up year after year. Um, and the really key question around you know, how much time there is left has to do with whether or not we continue to build infrastructure that locks us into fossil fuels. So that, for instance, the International Energy Agency says that our deadline is 2016 if we want to stay within... So uh, now, basically. Basically now. Yeah. And that's why I think th that there's been such a strong focus in the climate movement taking aim at these big infrastructure projects like pipelines or you know huge uh, liquid natural gas export Because of the long-term implications. Right, because if you look at, at, at the business plans for these uh, projects, they're built to last you know 40 years. Uh, and we actually need to be off fossil fuels by mid-century if we are going to stay within our carbon budget that's compatible with what our politicians said uh, when they went to Paris uh, well, in December. Well, on Paris, we had in December this what was called by many a landmark climate change deal in Paris. Its supporters say it achieved its major goal of agreeing to keep the global temperature increases well below uh, two degrees Celsius. President Obama called it a potential turning point for the world. I'm guessing you disagree with that assessment. Well, I would underline potential, like in, you know, in red over and over again. Um, look, there, there, there are things that are really important in the Paris deal. And, and exactly as you say, that goal uh, stated clearly that we, if we are going to stay safe, we need to keep temperatures below two degrees warming or do everything we can to keep them below 1.5. And that was really significant because for island nations, you know, the slogan is 1.5 to survive because, uh, you know, if anything above that, they disappear beneath the waves, low-lying island nations. Um, so the goal is good. Um, you know, it's the execution you worry about. Well, it's not just the execution. It's that it's the mechanism to meet the goal within the Paris Accord is something called INDCs. These are nationally determined targets. So the way it works is sort of um, uh, like a potluck approach. So rather than tell countries, okay, this is our carbon budget, and this is your slice, you know, China, and this is your slice, the United States. Um, that was deemed too top-down because we live in the era of deregulation. So the UN didn't want to tell governments what they were going to do. They just said, okay, everybody go home and make your best effort and fingers crossed when we add it all up, it'll, it'll match up with our stated goal. The problem is if you add up all the national targets that were set voluntarily by individual countries, it actually leads us to three to four degrees of warming. Mm. So double what politicians said they wanted to achieve. So, it, it, so it's the like Paris a potluck deal, without enough food. They've set themselves Or everybody targets. makes guacamole, like <laughs> as so often happens in a poorly, <laughs> poorly organized potluck. Yeah. So, so, so not as much hope on that front. Is it fair to say your issue with climate change is more ideological, more moral than it is purely environmental? It's about dealing with the underlying economic issues that have brought us to this potentially catastrophic juncture. Well, I mean, it's certainly fair to say that I come, uh, I, you know, I come at this issue as somebody who has studied the impacts of 
deregulated capitalism around the world. You know, we live in this era of what Joseph Stiglitz has called market fundamentalism, where you know it's all been about slashing regulations for corporations, privatizing the public sphere, um, keeping taxes low for corporations and the wealthy, all on the theory that what is good for elites is going to eventually trickle down and be yeah. good for everybody. Um, and we locked it all in under corporate-friendly free trade deals. So what I do in the book is look at the fundamental clash between those policy pillars and what we need to do in the face of climate change. Like, if you're going to reinvent your energy grid, if you're going to reinvent uh, you know, your transportation system, it's probably not a good idea to sell it off uh, to companies who are only interested in making yeah. as much money as they can. You know, if you are interested in having maximum policy flexibility, it's probably not a good idea to implement free trade deals that make it possible for corporations to sue national governments, as is happening, challenging important climate regulations. So isn't there a, a problem then for you when you explain it in that way, that there are a lot of people on the right, for example, all of the Republican presidential candidates, who say when they're asked about climate change, they say all of this stuff to tackle climate change isn't about protecting the environment, it's a cover for left-wing people to try and restrict capitalism, change our free market mm -hmm. way of doing things, bring in big government and socialism. And the problem is someone like you is saying, basically, yeah, they're right. You're agreeing with them. You're, you're, the subtitle to your book is Capitalism Versus the Climate. How well, will you win worse, over it's people worse on than the that. It's worse than that. I actually have a chapter in the book called The Right is Right about the fact that I believe that they do understand, you know, they're not right about the science. They're right that if climate change is true, their whole ideological project that says, you know, government has to get out of the way, let's free the market, um, that whole project has a big problem. And, you know, uh, the idea that we can deal with climate change within the confines of our current system is exactly what we've been trying for two decades, and it's failed miserably. You know, so instead of regulating, uh, you know, fossil fuel companies, we set up carbon markets in Europe, mm -hmm. and it became a magnet for fraud, and it was a boom-bust cycle like so many, you know, deregulated mm -hmm. markets. Um, you know, we told people that it wouldn't disrupt their lifestyles, they just had to shop more but for more green things, right? That also didn't lower Recycle emissions. A bit more. We focused on people as individuals um, as opposed to looking at what we can do collectively. So I actually believe we've tried the don't rock the boat approach and now it's time to try something different. And the good news is there are a lot of people who, under, who are, have an appetite for system change for a variety of other reasons besides climate change. Okay. Um, Putting the right to one side, the London Review of Books, a left-wing publication, not unsympathetic to you or your arguments, in its review of your book, This Changes Everything, it said you're an expert at exposing corporate wrongs, but less good at suggesting how to right them. You think, quote, a world-spanning predicament, such as catastrophic climate change, can, quote, be tackled with the same protest tools as the Vietnam War. What's your response to that criticism? But it hasn't really been a protest movement. Um, it's, it's been this, like, let's all hold hands, let's mm. make deals with big business, um, you know, we'll have cap and trade and, and climate markets and green capitalism. That's the approach that's failed. I think we've only really started building a real climate movement in the past five years, certainly in the global north, and you see, you know, the rise of fossil fuel divestment, which grows exponentially. It's now, there are now $3.4 trillion that have committed to divesting. Um, you, you have, you know, uh, protest movements like taking on Arctic drilling when, you know, when Shell uh, parked their drilling rig in Seattle and Bellingham and, and Portland, Oregon. Um, you know, that led to change in policy. So it's not to say, okay, a protest is going to stop climate change. But the fact that, for instance, there were 400,000 people on the streets of New York, I think is part of why we're seeing a different Obama in his second term than we saw in his first term. You know, Obama in his first term, without this kind of street pressure, um, did almost nothing in the face of climate change. Obama, in his second term, dealing with the movement against Keystone XL, uh, you know, Arctic drilling, you know, this mass movement demanding climate justice in the streets, is introducing all kinds of hmm. great legislation that would have been a hell of a lot better if he'd introduced it on day one. Rather than yeah. his lame duck year. Um, taking a step back, you didn't, of course, become a global name, a, a literary star over the issue of climate change. It was over globalization, quote unquote, anti-capitalism uh, your, with your first book, No Logo. Uh, what got you interested in? What got you so passionate about climate change and climate justice? Was it a particular event, a particular person? Yeah, well, I should say, I mean, I see a lot of, I mean, there's, there is a lot of continuity for me, even going back to, my, to, to No Logo, which I wrote when I was you know, a kid. Um, because that book was about how, in the 1990s, there was this explosion in, uh, in, in the kind of consumption that we had. I didn't understand when I was writing that book in my 20s that that was 
intimately linked to an explosion in emissions that I now understand in retrospect. But the, the turning point for me was you know, very clear. It was um, when I was writing The Shock Doctrine and um, I was in New Orleans uh, when Katrina struck. And it was covering that disaster, reporting on it um, at the time and then in the book that showed me where the, where the future lead, like where the road we're on, where it leads to if we don't swerve, right? Because Katrina was not just about heavy weather of the kind we're going to see more of because of climate change. You know, oceans warm, you have, you know, heavier storms. And, mm. and that Katrina was a vicious storm, Category 5 hurricane. But when it hit New Orleans, it had already been downgraded to a tropical storm. What turned that into a catastrophe was this toxic mixture of heavy weather meets weak and neglected public sphere meets institutionalized racism. And so that is what, what climate change looks like without system change. It looks like a public sphere that can't respond. It looks like the victims of that failure being vilified, called animals, looters, you know, on Fox News. So that was my wake up call. And that's why I'm not afraid to say, uh, if we want to avoid climate change, we need system change. And, and what about you personally today? How do you in your everyday life combat climate change? Because a lot of well-intentioned yeah. people, myself included, uh, that's what we find so difficult because you know, there's this expectation to give up driving or give up flying or now give up meat, which apparently also contributes to climate change. How do people on an individual basis, how do you inspire them to take those kind of steps? Um, well, first of all, because a lot of those steps actually improve our quality of life. I mean, if we if we don't spend all of our time in our cars and um, you know bike and walk and use transit, if we live in a city where that's possible, if we live in a context where that's where we have the right policies in place, um, then we then we'll actually be happier and healthier. And I find I am happier and healthier when I do those things. Same with eating less meat. Um, you know, my huge sin is flying. You know, I wrote in the book that, uh, you know, I finally you know, lost my frequent flyer status and cut my flying by 10%. But since the book has come out, even though I tried to do as much as I can by Skype, you know, I've been flying way too much. Um, and, you know, I don't make excuses for it. I think it's, I think it's terrible, frankly. Um, but what I, what I do say is, if the price of admission to this conversation is that we already have to be off fossil fuels, then this is going to be a conversation with two people in it because um, you know, we live in a society that is fueled by fossil fuels that make those good decisions really hard in a lot of cases. We don't have a good you know, fast rail system. Mm. Um, too many places don't have transit or safe bike lanes or all those things, which is why I focus on the policy less on those individual decisions. But I'm not saying they're not important. They are important, and anyone who wants to call me a hypocrite, you know, bring it on. Like, I, it, it's true. Less about the hypocrisy, more about the difficulty, I think. <laughs> it that is people difficult, find. Um, and that's why we need the policy. And let me, let me put this quote to you. The Nobel Prize winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman was asked about how to get people to take climate change seriously. And he replied, no amount of psychological awareness will overcome people's reluctance to lower their standard of living. So that's my bottom line. There is not much hope. I'm thoroughly pessimistic. I'm sorry. Is he wrong, in your view? Well, you know, I think... Um, I think he is wrong because the truth is that if you map out a response to climate change that is based in justice, then it's actually going to improve the quality of, of living for the majority of people. I mean, it is the 10% of, of the world that are the biggest consumers, and I'm part of that. Um, who are going to have to cut their standard of living. Yeah, but it isn't everybody. Good luck actually. to a politician who sells well, lower standards of living, well, surely. This, well, this is the reason why I make the argument that we have to connect the fight against inequality, the fight for racial justice, with the fight to lower emissions. Not by saying climate is more important than jobs, not by saying it's more important than your quality of, of, of life, but saying this is not just a middle class issue. This is an issue if we, that if we take seriously, offers the best prospects for huge numbers of people who are getting a really bad deal right now. Do you think uh, the work done by people like yourself, by Joseph Stiglitz, by the economist Thomas Piketty and others, do you think uh, that work to highlight the inequities, injustices of neoliberalism, extreme capitalism, do you think that's what's helped drive the rise of the likes of Bernie Sanders here in the United States or Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour leader in the UK, or Podemos in Spain or many other such movements around the world calling for radical economic change? Um, I think what drives it most is just people's lived experience. Um, and uh, you know, I think where 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 the where the research comes in, where the work comes in, um, is is it says to people, you're not crazy 
things really, you know, if we, if we look at the, the impact of Pictet's work, I think a lot of people, you know, saw that research and went, yeah, like I'm, you know, I'm living it, I'm seeing yeah. it everywhere. But at the same time, I think when it's reflected in the media, it does create space and it has created space for, for a candidate like, like, like Bernie Sanders to come forward and forcefully make inequality um, the, the, the election issue make, and make the need for campaign finance reform, you know, front and center. Um, but I think in terms of, uh, you know, the market for those ideas, that's what people are living, not what they're reading. Naomi Klein, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Thank you. Climate change is the biggest threat to our planet. We all agree on that, right? Well, maybe not everyone. Certainly not the climate change deniers in the US Congress, who according to one recent study have been on the receiving end of more than $73 million in campaign contributions from oil and gas interests. Think Koch brothers, the billionaire energy tycoons. Think ExxonMobil, the oil and gas giant. Oh, and guess what $73 million buys you? Climate change is not science, it's religion. I really believe it's the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people. If you're a believer in the Bible, uh, one would have to say the Great Flood is an example of climate change. I am not a scientist. Fair enough, Senator McConnell, you're clearly not a scientist. But the scientists you do rely on to bolster your denialist illogic aren't exactly impartial, are they? Take Wayhock Willie Soon, the most sought after of denier scientists. He's received more than $1.2 million from energy giants, including one of the Koch brothers. Money that he apparently just forgot to mention when he was writing his skeptical papers. What about the former MIT professor Richard Lindzen or climatologist Pat Michaels, both heroes to the climate skeptics? They work for the Cato Institute, co-founded by, yes, you guessed it, the Kochs. But look, the climate change denial machine goes way beyond those billionaire brothers. One recent study found that 140 conservative foundations funneled more than a half a billion dollars to nearly 100 climate denial organizations. So a lot of the quote unquote experts are financially compromised, conflicted. And a lot of them aren't even actual experts. Well, not in this particular field. A few years ago, the deniers got very excited by a US Senate endorsed list of almost 700 scientists who dissented from the consensus view on man-made climate change. Yet of those 700 scientists, less than 10% of them were actual climate scientists. Take the words of one of them, Ivor Jeeva, a physicist, by the way, from a speech in 2012. I'm not really terribly interested in global warming. Like most physicists, I don't think much about it. I spent a day or so, half a day maybe on Google, and I was horrified by what I learned. What? That's like asking a dermatologist to perform brain surgery after spending half a day Googling brain surgery. You just wouldn't do it. Or maybe you would if you're a climate change denier prone to conspiracy. Maybe then brain surgery might be the right way to go. The Paris Climate Change Agreement adopted in December has kindled a huge flame of hope. Those were the words of the UN's top official for climate change, Christiana Figueres. Critics of the agreement, however, have called it worthless and weak. So is the UN Paris deal an historic victory or a dangerous distraction? Christiana Figueres joins me now from Bonn. Uh, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Um, you're standing down this summer as UN climate change chief after six years in the job, six long years in which the planet has gotten hotter. What would you say to those who think, therefore, that your tenure, for all its good intentions, has been one of inaction, of failure. Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to, uh, to be here today. Uh, two things I think have been uh, the major lessons over the past uh, few years. The first, that it is completely impossible, unrealistic, and irrational to expect that a problem that has accumulated over 100 or maybe even 150 years can actually be fixed in one year or, in fact, even in one or two years. This is going to take several decades, I'm afraid, because what is required here is a transformation of the global economy. And the second thing that we've actually learned over the past six years, which is at very much at the basis of the Paris Agreement, is that it is completely untrue that we have to choose between addressing climate change and supporting the development of countries. So Paris actually puts in place a pathway that is going to take us over the next 5, 10, perhaps 15 years 
toward the uh, addressing climate change in an effective way in from the perspective of the countries. You praise uh, the Paris Accord as a success, the deal that was done in Paris in December. But James Hansen, the legendary NASA scientist who first raised awareness of climate change in the 1980s, described it as a fake a fraud. Friends of the Earth called it not sufficient, not strong enough, much too vague. Oxfam called it a frayed lifeline to the world's poor. Well, um, I wonder what they would have said if we had actually failed to come to any agreement in Paris. And, you know, it is very true, let me say, that from a purely scientific point of view, we are really getting to the last, last minutes in which we can credibly address climate change. I am no one to dispute that. The issue, however, is that science has very, very stringent timelines that in an ideal world we would certainly want to abide by, but that when you put into the reality of the world, you put policy, you put the the evolution of policy, the evolution of an economic system that has been in place for 150 years, then you get a very different timeline. But it's a policy framework which contains pledges made by individual governments that aren't really binding at all. They're non-binding. The UN, you, can't force individual governments to do anything in terms of the emissions targets they set for themselves, can you? No, which is exactly why those, uh, those contributions are actually quite strong, because they don't come from an external force. They're not anyone holding a pistol to anybody's head. They stem from the national interest, and they are completely coherent and co consistent with national development priorities. Hence, that is the most powerful lever, is what the national interest is. You say it's a str these pledges are strong because they're based on national interest. Let me quote to you what Naomi Klein, who I interviewed earlier on the show, said about this particular aspect of the Paris Accord. She said it was a potluck approach because, quote, the UN didn't want to tell governments what they were going to do. They just said, OK, everybody go home, make your best effort, fingers crossed. The problem is if you add up all the voluntary national targets, it actually leads us to three or four degrees of warming. She's right, isn't she? No, she's not. Um, Naomi is a, is a fantastic analyst and a good friend. Um, but here she's not, uh, she's not right. Uh, because actually, if implemented, the current set of contributions would lead us to anywhere between 2.7 or 3 degrees, which is much better than the 4 to 5 degrees increment that we had before these contributions. So and, better and the safe and goal improvement, is 1 .5 but certainly 5 degrees. not where we need to be, which is well below 2 degrees to 1.5 so degrees. You agree we're not so going to get because, to 1.5. Because we, we knew ahead of time that these, this collection of first efforts was not going to get us to 1.5, that is precisely why the Paris Agreement has understood that these contributions are the first, but certainly not the last step. They are the floor, they're not the ceiling. And the Paris Agreement actually puts in place a pathway of constant improvement over the next decades to actually get to peaking and then to a rapid descent until we're at the 1.5 pathway. What about uh, Naomi Klein's main argument? It's something you touched on earlier, uh, that it's capitalism versus the climate, that there is no way of stopping catastrophic climate change within our current uh, neoliberal economic system, because the whole point of a deregulated free market economy or free market system is to find resources and exploit them regardless of the environmental cost. Unless you change the economic system, there's no way you can beat climate change. Well, my experience actually is that certainly not 100% of the private sector, but uh, we do have a very, very interesting number of private sector representatives, whether those are corporations, whether they are investors, whether they are insurance companies that have actually understood that it is in their interest to address climate change, that it is in their interest to change their energy matrix, that it is in their interest to change investments. And you have a growing number of corporations that have actually already committed to either being 100% renewable or even better yet, already getting onto the path of 1.5. So let me tell you, the private sector cannot guarantee that we're going to get onto the 1.5 uh, pathway. But I tell you one thing, without them, it is absolutely clear that we're not going to get there. You've said you think the next UN Secretary General should be a woman. Should that woman be you? You've been called a woman to watch and one of the most promising candidates. 
it's not within my plans. But it should be a woman, you believe? I think so. It is about time. And there are many wonderfully capable women out there. Christiana Figueres, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Thank you. That's our show. Upfront will be back next week.